when there was a COVID pandemic, some of the blood groups were more resistant, some were not. So I think glycosylation is giving fine tuning and making each of us a bit different to increase our chances as a population to be more fit to a given challenges. Each of us is different and there is no universal diet. So some people can even cope with a high carbohydrate because now generally we believe now that high carbohydrate is bad. Some people benefit from keto diet, very low carbohydrate. Some people cannot cope with this type of a diet. There is no standard human. We are all very different. And also we change with time, depending on our microbiome. There is a specific diet which is good for us at a given moment, but we have to find out which. Okay, welcome. We have Professor Gordon Lauk with us today. He is coming, I assume you're still in, in, in Croatia, is that correct? Yes, I'm in Croatia, in Zagreb. Okay. Yeah, I had, I had the pleasure of visiting there about two years ago. I went to Dubrovnik and, and was also in Bosnia-Herzegovina at the same time in Mostar. So nice part of the world for sure. Professor Locke, tell us what you do. What is your sort of field of specialty, if you don't mind? So it's glycobiology in its very wide aspect. So glycobiology is studying the, the structure and the role of glycans and what they do in our in our biology. And glycans are one of the key sets of molecules. They evolved rapidly when we became multicellular organisms. So more or less basic metabolism is uh, bacterial and it's being done by proteins. All the intercellular communication, all the more evolved systems like the immune system, uh, brain, they more or less function on glycosylation because glycans modulate proteins, make them way more elaborate and enable us to do all the complex things we do. And For those that aren't familiar with glycans, many of us have heard of the term hemoglobin A1C, which is glycosylated hemoglobin. Is that very similar? Is it a type of glycan? That's, that, that's chemically, it's not that different because it's a carbohydrate attached to a protein, but the glycation is the random damage. You have high glucose, this glucose is chemically reacting with the protein and making glycated hemoglobin, which is damaged. And I usually say it's like taking a shotgun and firing at the protein, doing the random damage. Glycosylation is a sophisticated modification regulated by hundreds and thousands of genes. So analogy I like to make is that if you think about the bird, bird without feathers it is a protein, polypeptide part. And glycans are the feathers, so all the color, all the, the shape, or the ability to fly, it's given by the feathers. And for proteins, it's being given by the glycans. And we have, obviously, when we look at how we are different, we all have a sort of genetic, genetic differences, which are some level of complexity, but the glycans glycans provide an additional layer and, 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 a, and a much probably more diverse layer of, of complexity much, on how we differ. Is that fair to say? Much more diverse. When we talk about genes, bacteria like E. coli, they have 5,000 genes. Humans have slightly over 20,000 genes. And we are not only four times more complex than E. coli. We are thousands and thousands of times more complex than E. coli. And this is given by creating chemical structure, which are glycans, not from a single gene, but from networks of dozens and hundreds of genes. So glycans are actually additional layer of structural information generated by interacting hundreds or maybe even thousand genes in some situations. Even blood groups are glycans. So when you think about ABO blood groups, chemically, they're glycans. So the difference between a hemoglobin A1C is it's randomly damaged, whereas a glycan is there's a enzymatic pathway. There's a lot of structure that goes into that. And what are this? What is the significance of carrying what our glycan glycan variation is? How does that affect us practically? So this is something we still don't know. So we don't know what are the differences in people having A, B, and A, B, or O blood groups. But for example, when there was a COVID pandemic, some of the blood groups were more resistant, some were not. So I think glycosylation is giving fine tuning and making each of us a bit different to increase our chances as a population to be more fit to a given challenges. 
Maybe I can give you one example. So immunoglobulins, antibodies, are the main weapon of our immune system. So we have 15 grams per liter of immunoglobulin circulating in our body, trying all the four, trying to find all the foreign structures and eliminate them. But foreign structures can be dangerous or maybe not dangerous. For example, if the foreign structure is bacteria or a virus, it's an invasion, it's a threat. Our immune system has to eliminate this danger. But the foreign structure can also be the food we eat or a pollen we inhale. And if our immune system attacks food or a pollen or, or dust or whatever, then, then we have a problem. We have different allergies or that can even kill you. Antibodies are regulated by adding glycans. So antibody knows which antigen will it recognize, but it does not know what to do once it sees the antigen. And depending on a glycosylation, which is being added post it can even be modified in circulation, antibodies will either activate, for example, natural killer cells and kill the target, which should be done if the target is a virus-infected cell or a tumor cell, but it will ignore the antigen if it thinks it's either self-antigen or something we should ignore, like the food. And this is being achieved by adding different glycans to the same antibody. So the gene is the same, the protein is the same, but adding different glycans will either make antibody a killer, killing the cell, or just ignoring the something which is not considered to be dangerous. Now, people, there are differences in between people glycate or, or glycosylate things. Some of it uh, affected by their genetics, apparently, but also some of it is affected by the environment. So it can either go in a good direction or a bad direction. I know you've quantified or qualified that in, in, in a number of studies before. How do, do we know how much variation there is between people and what drives the differences? So far, we analyzed something like 200,000 different people from different large cohorts. And one of the things we did, we looked into heritability, meaning how heritable are these differences in glycosylation. And of course, for different glycans, it will be different. So it ranges between 30 and 70%. But for example, for the something we call the glycan age, which is a glycan index of aging, because some of the glycans change with age, and then we develop this glycan age thing. And for the glycan age, approximately 40% is genetic. That the pace of aging in glycans is 40% determined by our genes, so something what we inherited, but 60% is determined by our lifestyle decisions. For example, we did a large study on twins. We were looking at 2,000 twins in three time points across 15 years, so we had a three blood samples approximately every seven years, and then we saw that the twins who were gaining weight and usually when a single individual is changing weight, it's not by building muscle, it's by usually it's by accumulating fat. They are aging much faster than people who are maintaining weight or even losing weight. And people losing weight can even go in this different direction and actually reverse the glycan clock of aging and have their glycans younger than before. But not only um, obesity, some other lifestyle choices like uh, physical activity, even even what we think, stress can affect the pace of changing of glycans. Yeah, so obviously none of us are going to be changing our genetics anytime soon. So the best chance we have of reducing the glycan age would be through these various lifestyle modifications. When you say losing weight, is that I assume that's fat mass and not necessarily lean mass because I, I don't imagine we would want to see somebody losing a lot of lean mass. Is it? So, do we know if we've so determined in that, that? In that specific study, we do not know. But I think in, these are usually middle-aged women, and middle-aged women usually do not change the muscle mass significantly. And if it happens, it's relatively rare. So when you have 2,000 people, it's mostly either accumulating or losing fat. And do we know, for instance, you mentioned that I'd seen a previous lecture, and you talked about some exercises actually perhaps even detrimental. I know you talked about women that were competing in a uh, – physique competition where they actually increase their glycan age, which would be very yeah. controversial. What, what is the story on that? 
Uh, and actually, we, we have more data on that now, just published a couple of weeks ago. So we had 1,000 people, middle age, mostly women, mostly obese, put into the exercise program, first for three months. And we were working this together with the faculty of kinesiology here in Zagreb. So they had 1,000 middle-aged women. They were forcing them to exercise, maybe even a little bit too harshly. And most of them get actually worse, meaning they got more pro-inflammatory which is not so unexpected because once you start exercising, you always feel pain, your muscles are inflamed. Too much exercise leads to inflammation. And then we thought, okay, if we do it for a longer period, maybe it will get better. So we had them exercise for nine months and still most of them would actually be worse than at the beginning. Only when we compared people who maintain a, he a healthy, active lifestyle for a longer period, we, saw the, we see the beneficial effects. Exercise is, of course, good. Nobody should avoid exercise, but too much physical activity is not good. And it's really, it's hard to know for a given individual what is too much. One of the ways we now try to position this test we do is that at individual level, by, by doing the test before and after, we can see whether specific physical activity is good for you or not. And we did a number of studies with physical activity already, and more or less to have immediate beneficial effects, there has to be a sufficient uh, amount of relaxation. So physical activity, yes, it's, of course, is beneficial in many ways, but it's also promoting inflammation. But if you include sufficient relaxation, then you have immediate positive effects. What we are still lacking, and we have to do it in the future, is to look at a combination of diet and physical activity. Because depending on the diet, physical activity may have uh, different effects on a given individual, and of course, in the context of genetics of that individual person. On the context, on the, the modification that diet has, is it just any diet that allows you to lose weight is ideal? Are there advantages to one style? Because there's many ways people can lose weight. Some people use a very low-fat version. Some people use a low-carbohydrate version, high-protein, low-protein. Does it seem to matter, or do we have data on that? So we did a very interesting study. It was part of one of the European projects called Diogenes, where there was a 1,000 people who were first put on a low-calorie diet, a very extreme low calorie diet, 800 calories a day. So most of them less, lost over 10% of the body mass in the first two months. And nobody can maintain 800 calories uh, diet for a long period. So after two months, they were put on five different maintenance diets. So it was a combination of high glucose, in, uh, low glucose, uh, high protein, low protein, five different diets. And on each of the diets, some people got better and some people get, got worse. So I think diet is something which is extremely individual. So we as a population evolved to be diverse so that we can survive any type of change. Because what we have to be aware of that we are here because each of our ancestors for the last billion years managed to survive. Those who died didn't have offsprings and, and their, their genes are gone. So we are adapted to survive in, in changing conditions and in different conditions. So apparently each of us is different and it's, there is no universal diet which will be good for everybody. Some people can even cope with a high carbohydrate because now generally we believe now that high carbohydrate is bad, but some people can cope with a high, high carbohydrate. Some people benefit from, from a, Keto diet, very low carbohydrate. Some people cannot cope with this type of diet. So we are all very different. And by looking at our glycans, we can see how we respond to very, to these different diets. And I think, and also other people have shown it recently, especially what Tim Spector is doing with Zoe, is that there is no standard human. We are all very different. And also we change with time depending on our microbiome and there is a specific diet which is good for us at a given moment, but we have to find out which. Okay. And just 
more on this, the glycan age is also associated with certain disease conditions. I know, I, I think I saw a slide where you presented where cardiovascular disease was literally and directly proportional to glycan aging. Is that is that the case? So, so glycan age is a commercial product which is being marketed in a general health and wellness space. And I don't like to associate it directly with diseases because there are no medical claims which have been approved for the glycan age. But we can talk about the IgG glycans, which are the basis for the glycan age. And we have shown, indeed, that change, there are some changes in the IgG glycom, some glycans which appear in IgG, which are the, the best predictors of the future cardiovascular events, especially in women. Specific change in glycans can tell us who is at a high risk to get a heart attack or stroke in the next five to 10 years. And I think the, the biggest benefit of glycans in this respect is that they change five to 10 years before people develop disease. We have shown, we published many papers. We published over 300 papers so far. And some of them have shown that, for example, there are changes in glycans which are predictors of diabetes. And these glycans change gradually as somebody is going from a healthy state to a disease. And if you change your lifestyle, if you start doing some kind of a healthy things, then these glycans go in the opposite direction. So you can practically, on an individual level, monitor how somebody is approaching diabetes. And this is way before there is any change in HbA1c. So once you have changes in HbA1c, more or less, you're either in a very late stage of prediabetes or you are already diabetic. Glycans change five to 10 years before that. Okay. And with that, because people associate glycans with glucose, and I think probably that is part of the pathway, but I'm sure there's many biomarkers that are associated or, or at least contribute to this glycosylation of, I know fructose is involved at least in glycation, which may not have involved in glycosylation, but is there association between significant blood s a sugar variability in, in this glycan immuno IgG aging? So definitely glucose as the main source of energy is also overflowing into the process of glycosylation because it does. So all glycans are built from different monosaccharides and many of them can be made from glucose. So when there is too much glucose, then you get more mannose, more glucosamine and so on. And yes, glucose level do affect glycosylation in multiple different ways. So it's, of course, one very important element. And yes, high glucose will result, result in the changes in glycans. What about some other biomarkers? Do, do say, for instance, do, does our lipid, uh, serum lipids have a role like cholesterol or HDL triglycerides? Do those have any association? Or So there are very strong association between different um, metabolites and glycans. And we were actually even surprised to see that uh, HDL concentration is highly correlated with IgG glycan composition, which we don't understand yet. And many things we do not understand, and we don't know what of this is causative, meaning are changes in metabolism changing glycans, or are changes in glycans changing metabolism, because both are quite likely, because metabolites are resulting into glycans, and glycans are regulating all the proteins in the membrane, all the transporters, all the, the receptors. It can be both ways. For example, we have shown that if you change cellulation of the of HDL and LDL, it's affecting their functional properties. So changes in glycosylation of like proteins will affect cholesterol transport in and out of the cell. So it would actually be the changes in glycosylation which are affecting the cholesterol level. But uh, cholesterol level is overrated. Chol cholesterol level is something like 9% genetically defined. So we shouldn't be looking too much at our cholesterol levels. Yeah, interesting. Because we, we've been, uh, I'm a physician, and we've, for the last many decades, have really myopically focused on cholesterol to the probably the detriment of many of the other factors that might be more more valuable to look at perhaps. How easy or difficult or how significant of changes can one make with with lifestyle change? I know you examine yourself data. I'm sure you've looked at other people now. How, how much of an effect can we have on this? So it can be really radical. 
We had recently, there was one of the TV shows which are working with the really obese people and then putting in some kind of programs. And we had people losing two or three decades in glycan age within six months. But these were really extremely obese people. So if you're extremely obese, your glycan age will be horrible. If you lose your excess fat, your glycan age can improve for a couple of decades. And we have seen the same thing for bariatric surgery. So people undergoing bariatric surgery, most of them will lose at least a decade in their glycan age once they lose weight. What we still do not know, for example, we now have a one study which hasn't been finished yet. We went to see whether liposuction would do anything. So is it only the, the fact that you have a lot of fat which can generate inflammation? Is this driving the, the, the glycan age? Or it has to be lifestyle. So at the moment, we still don't know whether just removing fat will change your glycan age, but we know that if you lose mass by losing fat, your glycan age would improve definitely at least a couple of years and sometimes even for decades. What, you know, as far as obviously we lose weight by exercise, by changing our diet, there's probably some other hormonal things that are so maybe thyroid disease and things like that that'll impact that. Are there, I know I saw you said there was one anti aging doctor that puts people on various supplements and hormonal treatments. And I think you mentioned estrogen had quite a powerful impact on this as well. Can you speak to some of those other modifying factors? So definitely estrogen is a very strong regulator, both in women and men, because men also have a significant level of estrogen. And we had a placebo-controlled randomized trial. It was done in, in, in the States maybe even 20 years ago. The ladies in their 30s were put in kind of artificial menopause. They had chemical inhibitors of gonadal hormones. So their estrogen level went to the menop menopausal level. And their glycan age increased on average approximately 10 years in a few months. And there was a estrogen group where estradiol was added to a patch and also the control group where the placebo was given in a patch. And women who got estrogen, they did not increase in their glycan age, while the women on a placebo would gain this on average nine years, some of them even 30 years. So estrogen is a very strong regulator. Interesting in men, there was a branch of study in men where testosterone was added, and testosterone was also effective in preventing the, the increase in glycan age, but not if the aromatase was blocked. The aromatase is enzyme converting testosterone to estrogen, and sometimes when um, hormone optimization is being done and men want to have a high testosterone level, they block the conversion of uh, testosterone to estrogen by blocking aromatase. And if you do that, you don't have a beneficial effect on glycan age. It's estrogen in both men and women, which is functional. And we also did a number of studies showing that there are some genes below downstream from estrogen, which regulate IgG glycosylation. So estrogen is definitely important. We haven't done many studies for other hormones, so I wouldn't claim anything for other hormones. We know that it's, from correlation studies, we know, even from intervention studies, we know it's diet, physical activity. We haven't shown real intervention study where your kind of stress or psychological situation would affect uh, glycans, but we have seen very strong correlations in, in the cross-sectional studies. So obviously, the way you think, the way you behave, it's changing your physiology and it's also affecting your glycans. But we haven't found yet a good intervention cohort where you can actually fix it. Do we have any, you mentioned the IgGs, the aminoglobulins, and obviously that's part of the immune system. Do we have, do we have any sense of the fact that how this may impact things like autoimmune disease? We see a lot of biologic drugs used to modify these immune different immune regulating compounds, whether it's tumor necrosis factor or so on and so forth. But does that have a role? Is there an association between these gly glycans and immune disease, autoimmune diseases? So we did a lot in inflammatory diseases, including autoimmune and not that much autoimmune. 
And actually, the first study which showed that the glycans are changing in the disease was in the rheumatoid arthritis. And we know that all the inflammatory diseases, including the maybe the lupus is the most, has the most extensive changes, but also the Crohn, the ulcerative colitis, the rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, there are very extensive changes in IgG glycosylation, which usually correlates with the disease status. And some of the anti inflammatory monoclonals, like in Flixamab, for example, would have very strong effect on IgG glycosylation. So it will change IgG glycosylation, but not in everybody, in maybe half of the people. But interestingly, it does not correlate perfectly with the responders and the non-responders to the drug. So obviously, there are different pathobiological mechanisms which lead to these diseases, and some of these diseases are more glycan-dependent. Some of these pathways are more glycan-dependent and some are less. Because in medicine, we have one general problem, and this is that the classification of diseases is based on a location and a symptom and not on a pathophysiological mechanism. So we could have a very similar pathophysiological mechanism reflecting either as uh, arthritis or lupus or IBD, depending on genetic, epigenetic, environmental factors, while different mechanisms could have a very similar manifestation. So I think we'll have to do a lot of reclassification of all these inflammatory diseases. And we are currently part of very large IMEI 3TR grant in Europe, which is trying to reclassify all the inflammatory diseases and try to find a molecular signatures, molecular pathways of inflammation, which lead to different diseases because drugs are not targeting a disease name. They're targeting a biological mechanisms. So we have to know which mechanism it is for drugs to be effective. And glycans are definitely relevant there, extensive changes, but not in everybody. Probably just in maybe half or maybe 30, 40% of people where glycans are functionally relevant for disease development. I recall seeing a, a study a few years ago talking about the utility of something called carnosine in minimizing, I think, glycation or glycosylation. It was considered to be a very powerful molecule. It's something that's primarily found in animal source foods. And I think I, I saw somewhere where I, I think you had mentioned that you had a post deleted on LinkedIn because it was saying animal source foods are not a problem or something like that. Is there any thought on that? So th this is not our research. This is something what I shared. I think you believe it was a nature paper because unfortunately there is so much hidden commercial interest in all the recommendations for food and drugs. And it's very hard to know what is really the truth. For example, the meat has been systematically attacked for probably a few decades because there are some correlations between the meat consumption and, and many diseases. But the problem is that the data we have is very bad because I th personally what I think and, and what I know from, from what I'm reading is that I don't think the meat is the problem. I think it's the, the, the highly processed food which is a problem. And people often, when they eat meat, they eat highly processed food. So I think the, the, the vindication of meat as, as an unhealthy thing was uh, probably because of uh, ultra-processed food, which is uh, sometimes called meat. In, when you go to uh, McDonald's, it's not that like you are eating a healthy steak. You are eating some kind of a product which is undestroyable. You can leave it on a shelf for a decade. It will not change. So obviously, there is something bad in it if even bacteria won't eat it. That was not my study, but I firmly believe that everything what our ancestor, ancestors ate, and we evolved on meat, Meat was the, if you look in the caves, nobody is drawing, uh, there are no drawings uh, of plants in, in caves. It's only the animals. So uh, I don't think meat should be uh, avoided. I think meat is good. Do, is there any evidence that meat or lack of meat consumption has any impact on the glycome? Is there any evidence to that? Have you guys looked into that in any, so any way? We, we don't have evidence, but primarily because there is no good data. The, when you, as I said, we analyzed 200,000 people and 
all we know about their diet is from questionnaires and these questionnaires do not have information which will tell you whether somebody is eating good meat or somebody is eating ultra processed food. I think on a global problem, on a global level, we have a problem of actually getting a good data about deficiency and and sufficient levels of meat. But again, people are different. In, in India, you have hundreds of millions of people living without meat and they live, they're fine. So it's, I don't think anything should, should be generalized. Yeah, fair enough. You'd mentioned IgG and that can be difficult to measure, although you guys have now have a, a, a blood spot product where you put it on, on a little paper and, and you can analyze that now. How does, what does that measure and how accurate is that test? What we do with this glycan age as a commercial product is that we analyze, we do our standard IgG glycan profiling, meaning we take IgG, cut off the glycans, label each glycan with the fluorescent dye and directly profile it. So it's absolutely accurate and, and as good as it can be done. The reason we do it now from a dried blood stain is just because of logistics. So if somebody wants to do a test, if it would have to be a full blood, plasma separated, shipped, it's, it's a nightmare. For research, we mostly do the analysis from frozen plasma. So you take blood, separate plasma, and then pull out IgG from there. This commercial product goes from a dried blood stain, but it's a chemical structure and we do, did a lot of uh, uh, stability studies and there are some independent studies from other people saying that yes, indeed, if you dry a blood stain, you can fish out IgG, cut its glycans, quantify them. And I think the best, the best evidence that this is reliable and high quality data is that if you have the same person measuring after every few months, if there is no biological change, the glycan age would not change for more than a year. So the, the measurement error is probably less than a year. Why was uh, IgG, is there, obviously there are many millions of proteins and things that these glycans would, would affect. Why focus on those as opposed to another method to measuring glyco, gly, glycans? I think primarily because of convenience, because IgG is the most abundant glycoprotein. So when you look into blood, you can fish it easily. And the second reason is that glycans are functionally so important for immunoglobulins and the regulation of inflammation. Because we also look into other proteins. We can study uh, transferrin, we can study fibrinogen, we can study IgA, we can study uh, alpha manasic glycoprotein, haptoglobin, and we did some studies on all of them. And um, immunoglobulin glycans seem to be the most related to low-grade systemic inflammation. I think that the low-grade systemic inflammation is actually regulated by these IgG glycans. I think our immu immune system is using these circulating immunoglobulins as a tool to uh, either promote or suppress inflammation depending what we need. And this is why IgG glycans give us so much information about the health status of an individual. We, I guess from what I understand is we can't just assume that more glycosylation is bad and less is better, can we? Or is, or is it just, I guess it depends on what's glycated and, or glycosylated and what isn't. I think when we talk about the glycosylation compared to glycation, which is something completely different, there is no really more or less. It's the different structures which are being added. So for example, IgG has one glycosylation site and there is always a glycan on that site, one conserved site on the FC domain. And there is always one glycan there, but these glycans can be very different. They can be relatively small glycans, small structures which are promoting inflammation, and a little bit larger structures with the different monosaccharides added, which are then suppressing inflammation. So at least for IgG, it's not more or less, it's which kind of glycan is attached, because this glycan is an inflammation. It's a, like the switch converting the molecule from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory and so on. And this switch can actually be changed while protein is in circulation. So there is a way to modulate glycosylation of IgG once it's being made and when it's being circulated all around the body. 
As far as, because obviously people are going to listen to this and say, how do I improve my gly, gly, glycosylation or my glycam, my glycome? Are there any specific recommendations that we were at this point? Obviously losing weight if you've got excess body fat sounds like a pretty decent so one. Are there far, anything else? So far what we know, more or less any intervention which is generally believed to be healthy is helping the glycanage. And I think that the biggest value in doing the test is that it can tell us where should we focus. Because diet, physical activity, different type of foods, they affect very different individuals. For example, if you take me as an example, and I'm testing myself for nearly a decade now, and my glycanage is horrible. So once I discovered I have a bad glycanage, my first idea was I want to sweat it out. So I was hiking four or five hours a day in the mountains. I, I lost over 10 kilos. I became really fit, but I always had problems. My feet were hurting. I was exhausted and so on. And my glycanage did not improve much, very tiny little bit. And then I realized, okay, sweating it out does not work. And then when I was looking into my diet, eventually, and it took me a number of years to realize that actually I have a horrible response to fruit. I love fruits. I eat huge amounts of fruit. And I was thinking this is healthy because fruit is healthy. So what is bad if I'm eating figs or grapes or oranges? And apparently I have a horrible response to fruit. I'm even better if I'm eating cakes than fruit which nobody could intuitively think of. And some other aspects for many people, sleep is an issue. Not sleeping enough helps some, make some people get their worst glycanate. So if they improve sleep pattern, they improve their, for me, really not much. For me, primarily it's avoiding fruits and then I get better. And I think information which tell us where to focus. Should I exercise more? Should I go for a low carb diet? Or should I just go for a kind of a normal food, but avoid fruits? And then maybe I could even have a small dessert. This is what is I think most valuable because in, in the real life, we cannot fix everything. There are constraints. We don't have time. We cannot eat when we want to eat. Sometimes we have to go to business dinners and then we have to eat something. So I think telling you where to focus is something which is really valuable. How, you said, so avoiding fruits, how, if you've done that, how much of an impact did that have on you when you removed the fruit from the diet? I assume you did. So this is something what I started only recently because, so I didn't learn that from a glycanage itself. So I just realized I cannot fix my glycanage. And then I took a C gems to have a little bit better control over glucose. And this is how I learned that fruits are so bad for me. Uh, I, I don't know yet. I, I have to see. But I know that I reversed the trend, so my glycanage is going down. So let's see how down can I get. As far as you'd mentioned, let's see. So for you, it was fruit. For other people, it'd be something else. How long does it take to change the glycan age? Is this something that happens within days, months, weeks? How do we know? So I would say months. So if the change is moderate, it will take at least two to three months to see the first effect. But recently we did a study of people who went on a zero, zero calorie diet for a week. So they didn't eat anything for a week. And there we saw an effect in a week. So if you do something drastic and if you, if you take some, uh, some drugs or some hormones, you can see effects in a couple of weeks. But for normal lifestyle interventions, like changing a diet a bit, exercising a little bit more, it, it's months, three, six, nine, depending how, how drastically you change your lifestyle. Because one important thing is, so we are looking at glycans at immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins have a half-life of approximately three weeks. So what we are measuring now was made three, four, five weeks ago. So when I change something in me, so for example, if I change my diet, for this to change my metabolism, it will take a couple of weeks. And then the new immunoglobulins are being made in a new condition, and they will start to dominate the glycome within another five to six weeks. So this is why it takes time. But I think this is good because 
If you want to have a measure of, of a kind of a long-term health or long-term longevity prospects, then you cannot fix it in, in a week. If you are doing damage yourself for, for decades, you cannot fix it in a two days. It does take some time to improve. What about going the other way? Do we have evidence that certain negative lifestyle or, or environmental things can cause a rapid deterioration of the glycome? So we know that some diseases can be very rapid. For example, some viral infections, for example, severe COVID. Some people with severe COVID would age for 15, 20 years within a week or two, which was horrifying. And actually it was these people who were aging so rapidly, they mostly died. So it's a kind of, you go in a bad direction and it's not good. Gaining weight, becoming fat is horrible. Losing your hormones is it's also very strong. And I think, so for example, when women are approaching menopause, this perimenopause period can be really difficult because they may still not be aware what is going on. And then there are some different symptoms which are often misdiagnosed. And what we have shown that the changes in glycan age and acceleration in glycan age is, the, is one of the first indicators that somebody is approaching perimenopause. Is there any, I would imagine there's probably a correlation also with for things like dementia, because we can see, I think, with FMR, functional MRIs and things like that. So, any, um, any evidence of that? So we haven't done a proper large study, so I can't say anything yet, because one of the things I'm really proud of is that whatever we have published in the last decade, it always replicated. And what we have shown, this was really true. And to be able to be sure that what you are seeing is really true, you have to have a large study. The small studies are usually giving random results. So I wouldn't claim anything for dementia. Of course, there will be a correlation, but how causative it is, I, I don't know. You had mentioned you're, you're, you, you recently pursued using a CGM. Is there any relationship between CGM findings and, and this, this, this glycan age? Is that, is that something you've seen or looked at? So again, we don't have a large study from, from, because if you talk about CGM data, the question is how do you convert it into a single number if you want to do a cross-sectional? So it's not easy. So if you just talk about the average glucose level, yes, we know there is a correlation between average glucose level and, and the glycan age. We still do not know how to really interpret CGM data. Some people claim it's the spikes which are dangerous. Other people claim it's not so much a spike, it's more or less the total area under the curve. We still don't have data. Yeah, it'd be interesting and because you'd mentioned for you, fruit was an issue. And I don't know if you see a large spike or if it just, I would imagine that's probably what's going on. And at least, correct me if I'm wrong, is that fair to say? Sorry? So with regard to you, you said fruit is problematic for you for both just the way you feel and then also inflammation and the so-called glycan aging. Does that, does, does fruit for you also cause extreme variability in your CGM readings? So for example, if I eat few oranges, I would have a huge spike for three or four hours, more than for a complete meal which is, I was always expecting, yes, fruit will give you a spike, but it will go quickly down. For me, it stays high for a long time. I don't know why. Yeah, maybe diabetic pathophysiology is underlying some level of insulin resistance because you said for years, perhaps you didn't have a, a lifestyle as, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what your lifestyle was previously, but could contribute to that. But we did, so now this is a little bit different topic, but we have done studies on a subtype of diabetes called Modi, maturity onset diabetes of the young. And this is, this has a special change in glycosylation. And it seems that there is a sub, there is a subgroup of type two diabetics, which have a similar mechanism because this HNF1 alpha is being epigenetically inactivated only in, in a beta cells. But I think one of the problems for diabetes is that diabetes is not a disease. Diabetes is a symptom. And we have probably many molecular pathways leading to diabetes, and some of them will be more and some of them will be less glycan-dependent because glycosylation regulates the half-life of both the insulin receptor and the glute transporters on the membrane. But probably to the different aspect in different people. 
So it's, yeah, it's again, it comes to the definition of a disease. We, if we stratify diabetes according to the molecular pathophysiology, definitely there is one where glycans are very important, but maybe not from others. So it's complicated again. So, so you, remind me, you said there, you guys have a, a product. So if the average person wanted to check their glycan age, how could they do that? So the glycan age is a commercial product. You can go to the glycanage.com website and, and buy it more or less anywhere in the world. So I'm not, I'm the founder of the test. I'm one of the inventors on, on a patent. So I'm always oh, obviously very conflicted here. So I don't want to promote it too much. What I always say is that through my science, I try to generate data and we publish papers. And then who is interested, they can look into our papers, look into data and make their own conclusions. Because if I'm claiming the thing which I am producing and making money out of it is good, maybe I'm just claiming it because I make money out of it. What, how much, like say your average 40 year old does a glycan test, could it show I'm 60 or 70 versus I'm 20? How much variability between chronological age and glycan age do we see? It can be decades in variation. So we have people who are 30, 40 years older or younger in glycan age. So, you know, I'm, I'm not age. There's no golden standard for biological age. And we don't really know what it means. And I usually tell to people, it doesn't really matter whether you are 5, 7, 11 years younger or older. It's more important, how does it change? So are you aging faster than your chronological age or are you maybe even going into the opposite direction? Because if you remember from the beginning, 40% of it is genetic. So maybe you have a genetic offset of 10 years, which you cannot change. It does increase some of the risk of diseases, but there's nothing you can do about this genetic part. So if you do your first test and you turn out to be 10 years older, I wouldn't panic. And if I would be 10 years younger, I wouldn't celebrate, but then I would do another test in a year and then maybe in a year and see how my lifestyle is affecting the pace of aging. Because what we know is that this pace of glycan aging is highly correlated with the expected, with the life expectancy. We did a large study on 27 populations all around the world and the this pace of glycan aging is highly correlating with uh, the expected life life expectancy and also the human development index of a country. So if you live in a country with a short expected lifespan, your glycans are aging much, much faster. And this also works on an individual level. So if you're really aging quickly in your glycan age, this is not good. You're doing something wrong. Your, your inflammation is increasing. You should do something to change it. And once you find what works and then you see that your glycan age and, and the underlying inflammation is going down, then you know that you're doing something good for yourself. Does, there are a number of commercial products out there that, that take blood samples and, and claim to have an age component to that. Do these all send a tr- trend in the same direction? If I get a glycan age and I do use some other commercial product, are they going to generally go the same direction or do we have any idea on that? They they can be very different. For example, we did several large studies comparing the epigenetic aging and the glycan aging. And of course, epigenetic and glycan age, they will correlate because they all correlate with age. But the acceleration in epigenetic and glycan aging don't correlate at all. These are two different mechanisms. But then again, epigenetic aging, there are at least 15, 20 different tests for epigenetic age. So some of them show uh, different things. You cannot just generalize and say epigenetic aging. For all, all other tests, they're mostly based on comparing different blood parameters, which are regularly being tested. And usually they are highly variable, meaning if you do yourself in a few months apart, they can get very different numbers. And also they are highly affected by, I don't know, what you ate yesterday or whether you had a small infection or something like that. There was a recent paper in Cell by the Consortium for the Biomark of Aging, and they clearly identified that the glycan age is the only commercial test which can monitor effects of lifestyle intervention 
and which associate with a number of different diseases. So yes, it is my test. We developed it, but I think it is the, by far, it's the best at the market at the moment. Okay. We've got a few minutes left, Professor Locke. Anything you guys are working on or direction you guys are heading or any other studies that are coming out that, that are interesting to you? So at the moment, we are trying to collaborate with more or less everybody performing an anti-aging intervention or um, all the products which are coming to the market, we try to test them. For example, recently we tested these plasma fraction from pigs, which were used to rejuvenate rats. And we did see a fascinating effect. I was really surprised to see how strong effect this intervention had. We tested a number of different other products. Most of them did not show very strong effect. We didn't really publish these because if you're doing a collaboration with the, with the producer of a supplement and a supplement doesn't work, they don't want to publish it. So many of this data is not published yet, but this is what we are currently trying to do, to look into effects of different things which people try to do. And we try to do it in a way that we always have a, a placebo arm or any kind of a control, because if you don't have a control arm, it's very hard to know what is really affecting your results. So this is what we are trying to do at the moment. Collaborate with uh, literally hundreds of clinics all around the world, see what they're trying to do, and use our test to demonstrate that it works. Very good. Professor Locke, I know you've got a, a meeting you've got to go to as well, as do I. So thank you so much for doing this. Like I said, this will probably be up in uh, probably a couple of weeks when we'll get it edited and recorded. Thank you very much. So keep up the good work, and we'll look forward to hearing more from this Glycan age and stuff from you down the road. Thank you. Oh, thank you.